The funny thing is, I was preparing the word that I have for you today, not knowing that I was going to be asked to speak this morning. But in preparing it, I realized that it was for you. It was for the house. It's partly prophetic, the word that God gave me. And so I pray this morning that your hearts will be open to receive and hear what God has to say. It's very important that you get this word this morning and get it in your spirit and take it into 2019. We just come out of a series called Saturation for the last month. So wasn't that a good series? Saturation. Preferably all of us have elevated our prayer life and got closer to God in that series. I know I have been more disciplined in my prayer time now ever since that series started. I get up when I want to and lay before God. So I pray that that series has blessed your life. And what God said to me is, hear me. Now that you've been saturated, you can't go back. It's going to make sense in a minute. Now that you've been saturated, you can't go back. For some, it's a very deep meaning because you knew where you were when God started the saturation. And now, you've got so much of him within you. If you try to go back, it may cost you your life. So what does the word have to say about saturation? You know, the songwriter, Will McDowell, wrote something. He says, the song is simple. It says, I won't go back. I can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me. There's something that happens when God's life changes us that we can't afford to go back to a former life. Let's go to the word. I will paraphrase the scripture. We're in Genesis 19. If you don't know what Genesis is, we have leaders after the service that will pray for you. Uh, it is the first book of the holy book. We will look at verse 15. But before we get to verse 15, let me just give you a backdrop of the story. It's a very familiar passage in the Bible. We've heard it preached many a times, many different ways. But the core, the principles of the text still mean the same thing. Lot was in a city called Sodom, right? That's where we get the word sodomy from. It was a city that had been so saturated with sin that God decided, I need to destroy the whole city. I got to destroy it. It's at a point of no return. So in chapter 18, Abraham and God are having conversation about the destruction of the city. God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy this city. So him and Abraham are going back and forth. And then God says to Abraham, if I can find one righteous man, I'll spare the city. Right? And so the story goes forward. The angels come to Sodom and Gomorrah because God is getting ready to destroy the city. So they come to tell Lot what's going on, what's getting ready to happen. As the angels are coming into the city and get to Lot house, some of us know the story. They're being chased by men with a homosexual nature. It's in the text. So you ain't, I ain't saying that out of my It's in the text. They're chasing him and they chase him to Lot's house and Lot 
has the responsibility. Back in that day, if I invited you into my house, I had to do whatever it takes to protect you while you were in my presence. So Lot says, I'll even give up my virgin daughters to protect these angels that God has sent to my house. Now, that's a story all in itself because I, I wrestled with that because I didn't understand. I said, well, why would you give up your daughters to save? I can't see me giving up my daughters for anything. Most of the moms in here, most dads in here couldn't even fathom the thought of giving up their children for somebody that they don't even know. Right? So... He says he's given up his daughter, but what God revealed to me was they probably wouldn't have messed. Because I, I was like, well, why would he give up? We understand that he had to protect the people that was in the house. But also, the fact that they were a group of men that engaged in homosexuality, he probably wouldn't have messed with the daughters anyway. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say why. He sent his daughters. But let's pick it up at verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. He was merciful. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Free, flee for your lives. Don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me and sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me and I will die. Lot didn't think he had enough time before God rained down his judgment to make it to the mountains. So he, now he's negotiating with the angels. And he says, look here, there's a town near to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. The angel says to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I can't do anything until you reach it. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens thus he overthrew those cities the entire plain destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt father we pray that you will breathe life into this passage and Father, we pray that lives will be changed, lives will be overturned. And in the last few days of this year, everything that you've done in the lives of your people, they won't look back. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody just say, don't look back. Come on, say it like if you look back, you may turn to a pillar of salt. Don't look back. All right, we're going to try it one last time. Don't look back. All right, y'all got it now. We can roll now. There's a few things about Lot you must understand to understand the story. 
So here is Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, so he came from good lineage. He had a pretty solid background. Amen. And so Lot goes to the city of Sodom, and he is the gatekeeper of the city. He is the judge of the city. And the thing about Lot is he had control. This is important. He had control over what came in the city and what left the city. Interesting. Lot had the position of authority, but he didn't have the respect of the people. It doesn't matter what position you're in. Pop, you'll appreciate this. It doesn't matter what position you're in, in leadership, if the people don't respect you, it's just a title. <laughs> you get it. So Lot's there, and Sodom has gotten so out of control. And here's why the people didn't respect Lot. Because Lot, if you study the text, Lot had backslid. <laughs> he backslid, and then he was put into a position of authority. So it's just like our lives. We've made some mistakes. We've made some bad decisions. And then God elevates us to a position of authority. And here's the problem. When you get elevated to a position of authority, there's always somebody who wants to remind you of what you did in your former life. Oh. Oh, I know I'm in the house. Isn't it funny how that works? We can talk about people in the Bible that God changed their lives. Paul, one of my favorite people in the Bible, was Saul. He was a murderer amongst a um, amalgam of other things. But we can look at his life as Christians and say, oh my God, look at the work God did in his life. He changed his life. He wrote books of the Bible. But the person right in front of you, who God did the same thing for, we can't see it. <laughs> we want to remind them of what they did in the past. You're trying to move forward because you have put those things behind you and you're doing your best not to look back. But there's somebody always in your ear reminding you of what was behind you. One thing I loved about Lot was he understood something. His righteousness was the only thing that saved him. Think about it. God is getting ready to destroy the entire city. And he says, if you can find me one righteous man, I'll spare the whole city. God couldn't destroy the city until he got Lot out of the city because he would have violated his own principle. So God had to get Lot out of the city before he destroyed it. Now, you may say, well, well okay, I get that. Righteousness doesn't mean you're perfect. And it's funny to me, most of the people that want to bring back your past or throw your past in, the, in your face are people that are not even doing anything for themselves. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. If you look at their life, you see me progressing. You see me buying businesses. You see me maybe starting a church. Whatever you're doing, making progress. I put my past behind me. Here's somebody. But didn't you just file bankruptcy? How are you going to start a business? That's how people are. You're going to start a church? How are you going to start a church and you did X, Y, Z in your past? That's how people are. You want to go back to school? You're too old to go back to school. People will always remind you of what you did in your past. And you must stay righteousness. Because here's the thing. No one knew when God was going to rain judgment on that city. Lot had a few things he could have done. He could have fell into the trap. And gave up his righteousness like some of us do 
or gave up our holiness like some of us do to fit in because we get so tired of people reminding us of what we did that we give up. Some people in your life are just dream killers. They don't want to see you do nothing that exceeds what they're doing in their life, and most of the time it's nothing. So here's the thing. You never know your righteousness may just be the only thing that saves your life. That's the only thing that, said, that saved Lot's life, is he was a righteous man. God never brought up what he did in his past. God never brought up the things of his past. God said he's a righteous man. Even David. David said, well, Bathsheba, we, we know the story. But the Bible said he's still a man after God's own what? Don't let the mistakes in your life or let people bring up your past or your mistakes in your life hinder you from doing what God has called you to do. Amen. Somebody say, don't look back. Just don't look back. It's behind me now. Don't look back. Here's the other thing I, I admire about Lot. It's this. Sometimes God will give you a word that may seem selfish. What do you mean? Sometimes the word that God may give you is specifically for you. And we as human beings, we have a heart. We love people. Sometimes when God gives us a word, we're more concerned about other people's well-being than we're concerned about the word that God gave for us. And Lot understood that. I'm sure when God told Lot, you got to leave the city. I'm sure he had family there. I'm sure he had some friends. He had two daughters. I'm sure his daughters had friends. I'm sure his wife probably had a few friends or people that they knew. And God said, nope. Only the people in your house, Lot. Sometimes God gives a word just for you. It's only for you. It's only for your family. And though we have a heart for everybody, everybody, we want to see everybody make it. We want to see everybody be successful. Sometimes the word is just for you. Don't discount the word that God has given you. You. Let God worry about everybody else later. But if he gives you a word, heed that word. Because you don't know the ramifications or the consequences of not obeying his word. Just ask Lot's wife. Don't look back. He never said, if you look back, I'm going to turn you into a pillar of salt. Nowhere in the text will you find that. He just said, don't look back. Sometimes God will tell you, just go and do X, Y, Z. What? Just do what he tell you to do. We can't afford the consequences of not obeying him because there always will be consequences when we don't obey God. What they are, we don't know. Here's another thing. When God eradicates your past, It's up to you not to look back. You will always have people, like I said earlier, you will always have people that try to pull you back. But you make the decision whether you look back or not. You make the decision whether I'm not going to fulfill the purpose and the plan that God has for my life based on what somebody else said. And the only person that can dictate that is you. Somebody say, don't look back. Oh, yeah. Don't look back. Please don't look back. I think about some things that happened in my life this year, and I realized, though they were, some was good, but some was very detrimental to me. I lost my daughter in March. 
Mom got diagnosed with brain cancer a few months later. In the midst of all that, can't look back. I got to keep moving forward. People always say, man, how you do it? It's the grace of God. One day at a time, you're right. Some days are harder than others, but I keep pushing forward because I know what God told me and I know what I have to do. Through my pain, through my crying, I still got to do what God called me to do. Some stuff I don't understand. Sometimes it's going to be fuzzy for you. You're not going to understand everything. But as you go, he'll give you more. He'll give you more. You keep pushing. You keep pressing. He knows he, that's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. They're obeying what I told them to do. I have no choice but to provide provision for them as they obey me. So there's three dangers to looking back. That's what God showed me. If you're taking notes, you might want to write these three things down because they can be detrimental to your growth. The first thing, when we look back, we take our eyes off God and look for validation from other people. dangerous you're looking for someone to validate you that doesn't have the capacity to validate you there's only one person that can validate you it's God people can speak over your life I believe that people can encourage you I believe that people can help you people can mentor you I believe that but validation comes from God. Too many times we turn back and be like, hey, you know what? God told me this, Betty. But Betty, what you think? I understand the concept. But why does Betty's opinion matter? God told me to start a new job. Okay, start a new job. Well, I just want to know what you think about it. What does it matter what I think or what I say and I know what God told you? We have to get out that mindset of being validated by someone's opinion when God has already given us divine instruction. We all do it. I do it sometimes. I do it. I admit it. But we got to do a better job that if God gives us the word, we have to understand that if he gives us the word, he's going to provide provision for the word that he's spoken over our life. Stop going to people who can't help you. And some of them don't even mean you no good. They'll give you bad advice just because they don't want to see you. Very important. The second thing, you will never see your future looking backwards. I was on YouTube. I mean, it was funny, but maybe it wasn't funny, right? I find humor and stuff that my wife be like, babe, that is not funny. Yeah, it was funny to me. So if you go on YouTube, I think I put in like people running in the polls. Everybody that ran into a pole was looking backwards. Why? Because they couldn't see what was in front of them. They're running looking like this, and bam, hit the pole. You can't see what's in front of you looking backwards. And it has stagnated so many of our lives because we're in the wrong circles. We have the wrong set of friends. And all they want to do is remind us of what God has delivered us from. 
And friends have influence in our lives. We can say they don't, but they do. We value people's opinion. Right? Even if it's contrary to what God said to us or told us, we still value it because, well, they wouldn't want to hurt my feelings. They save too. They're Christians too. Everybody don't have your best interest that smile in your face. You got to have people that care more about where you're going than care about where you came from. Amen? Is this helping somebody? Amen. The third thing. Lot's wife had to find this one out the hard way. The consequences of looking back can ultimately lead to death. You know, for years, Ramsey, I would hear this story. I would hear people preach this story. And I always thought, that God turned her into a pillar of salt while they were running. Anybody ever thought that? Who knows the story? I thought while they were running, he turned her into a pillar of salt. Wrong. The Bible says they were already in Zohar. They were already in a safe place. They were already sitting there. And then she chose to look back. Because I always thought, when I hear people preach it, I always thought, she's running, maybe she dropped something, or she hear people chasing her, and she looked back and, phew, feel her saw. That's what I thought, right? Because I've heard it preached like that so many times at that's. But when I start studying it for myself, I realize that ain't how the story went. God got you to a safe place, and you're still concerned about what's behind you. And you want to hear something funny? All right, men, look this way. Don't look to the left. Just the men, look this way. You know the funny thing? <laughs> Her husband didn't look to see what she was looking at. Wouldn't it have been instinctive if I'm sitting with my wife and my two children I see my wife turn around. And as she turns around, she turns to a pillar of salt. Wouldn't it have been instinctive for me to be sitting there and do the same thing? If my wife falls, I'm going to look to see what happened. If my child falls, I'm looking to see what happened. But Lot understood something. I can't look back even if it means I lost my wife. I got too much ahead of me to look to see what's behind me. Oh yeah, it's a good place to clap because we got to understand that we don't understand or we don't know the consequences of looking back. She didn't know what it was going to cost her to look back. He didn't know what was going to cost him to look back. But she looked back anyway. And the rest is history. Now, I've done a commentary. I read some commentary on this because I was trying to figure out why did she look back? What was so important to her or so valuable to her about her past that she couldn't appreciate what God had set her at? She must have valued something back there that was more important to where she was going. Now, commentaries, they, you, you read commentaries, they, everybody, it's just their opinion, right? That's all it is. Commentary is an opinion. There's some believe that she had family members back there, and that's why she was looking. There's some believe that she had some things of value, that's why she was looking. But here's the reason. It doesn't, we don't know, and it don't matter. God told her, don't look back. Because regardless of what it was, it wasn't more valuable to where, they were, where God was taking them. Somebody, look at somebody and say, hey, look, don't look back. Just tell them, don't look back. 
Let me see. Let me see, my Lord. Because I know y'all are visual people. So I got to break it down for y'all visually. Now, I've been known to make a cake or two in my life, right? Yeah. So for men, this is a cake pan. This is not a Frisbee. It's not a mechanical device. It's a cake pan. Now, for me to bake a cake in this pan, it takes me about 30 minutes for the cake to be fully baked. About 30 minutes. And it's funny because when I first start making cakes a lot, my cakes would fall. Anybody here ever made a cake that fell? You ain't got to admit it. I know some of y'all have. And um, I couldn't figure out why? Somebody say 15. How many more days we got left in the year? 15. 15 days left. But what I understood was this about baking a cake. It's not the first 15 minutes that's so valuable. It's the last 15 minutes. I'm trying to tell y'all something prophetically. Y'all better catch it. It's the last 15 that's more important than the first 350. And so while you're baking the cake, there's whatever didn't happen in the first 15 minutes of the cake, it has the capacity to make it up in the last 15. Okay. Y'all ain't getting it. See, just like God, there's this stuff called baking powder. It's called double-acting baking powder. So whatever it doesn't get done in the first 15 minutes, there's something that kicks in. It's called double-acting baking powder, and it kicks in in the last 15 minutes. And whatever it gets done in the first 15, it makes up for it in the last 15. And God came to tell you today that whatever he didn't do in the first 350, some of y'all, you got 15 days. 15 days. God can turn it around in 15 days because he's done too much for us to take it back into the new year. We can't afford to take it back to the new year. We can't afford to take it into 2019. He's done too much. Yet he still has so much to do. Don't miss your blessing. Don't be a walking pillar of salt. Because you keep looking back. Some of y'all won't catch this until you're in your car today. You're still alive. You're still breathing. You still got blood running through your veins. But you're so concerned with what's behind you that you can't see what's in front of you. And if you're in this room today and you need God to do something in these last 15 days, I don't need to know what it is. I don't care to know what it is. That's between you and God. I want you to stand. I want to pray for you. I'll wait. Because I know there's some of you that if he doesn't do it in these 15 days, you're going to lose your mind. Your destiny depends on it. This ain't about who's sitting next to you because they can't help you. I know it's more than you. More in you that are standing that needs God to do something that only he can do in the last 15 days I'll wait 30 more seconds I know it is because I know God gave it to me I know what God showed me I know what he showed me I know what he showed me when he showed it to me I started crying I know what he showed me 
If he doesn't do it in 15 days, I may lose it all. I may lose my mind. I got to get it done before the end of the year. You can stay where you are. You can come down here wherever you want to do. This place long enough And your mountain sky has been rough The struggle is over for you Your struggle is over your struggle is over for you. The struggle is over. The struggle.